Good afternoon and thank you for joining us on the webinar sessions in gastroenterology on sharecaregastro.com. Today's webinar pertains to practice points relevant to the management of diarrhea. Dr. Sanjay Sikha will be providing viewpoints on the subject. Dr. Sanjay Sikha is an eminent gastroenterologist and hepatologist currently practicing in the Indiprest Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. Dr. Sikha specializes and has years of teaching experience in gastroenterology, hepatology and therapeutic endoscopy and has been a prominent practitioner for over 30 years. Without further ado, I would like you to introduce you to the webinar on diarrhea. Good afternoon colleagues. Today I will be telling you about diarrhea which is a common problem faced in day to day practice. Diarrhea is a complex problem and the treatment is very challenging. Not a disease but it is a symptom or a sign which comes into many diseases. Said to be when the stools are liquid more in frequency and in volume. Objectively diarrhea is defined as in stool weight or volume if it is more than 200 grams per day or 200 ml per day. Diarrhea is a condition of altered intestinal water and electrolyte transport. Water itself is not actively transported across the intestinal mucosa but moves across secondary to osmotic forces generated by the solutes and electrolytes and nutrients. Normally absorption and secretion takes place simultaneously but absorption is quantitatively greater. Either a decrease in absorption or increase in secretion will lead to diarrhea. Based on the pathophysiology mechanism, diarrhea can be osmotic, secretory, inflammatory or because of altered motility. Now, I will put across to you five simplified steps by which we can come to a conclusion what is the reason for the diarrhea and how to manage them. Management can always be tailored once we know the exact cause of diarrhea. First and foremost, we must know whether the patient actually has diarrhea. We must be aware of two more most common things which mimic diarrhea is fecal incontinence or fecal impaction. We must also rule out whether the patient is on any medication which can result in diarrhea. And in this, a good history is very important. Any diarrhea occurring with the onset of a new medicine could be linked to the intake of that medicine. Then we must, the next step is acute and chronic diarrhea have to be categorized into inflammatory, fatty or watery. And last but not the least, we should also be, know, <coughs> we should be aware of factitious diarrhea. The first step is, does the patient really have diarrhea, we have as I told you we should be aware of fecal incontinence and fecal impaction. Now fecal incontinence is involuntary release of the rectal contents. This is basically caused by an anal sphincter dysfunction and it is not due to dysregulated intestinal fluid or electrolyte absorption as I have told you about. Such patients should be evaluated, evaluated for incontinence and not for diarrhea. Now coming to fecal impaction. Patients with chronic constipation may develop fecal impaction and this is caused by inability to expel the fecal mass through the anus. Now what happens in this case is rectal digestion causes relaxation of the internal anal sphincter inducing secretions proximal to the obstructing stools which results in diarrhea. So basically there is overflow. Now how do we differentiate between fecal incontinence and fecal, fecal impaction is just a very simple test is by do an examination in which we see the tone of the anal sphincter and we can differentiate between fecal incontinence and fecal, fecal impaction. Next step to the patient with diarrhea is what are the medications the patient has started on. Almost all medicines can cause diarrhea, most frequently are anti-acids, antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, nutritional supplements if given too much an amount, chemotherapeutic agents and post radiations in patients who have got GI malignancies. Now the pathophysiology of the drug induced diarrhea is very complex and varied. It can be caused by activation of specific receptors and transporters 
alteration in colonic bacterial flora, antibiotics commonly like combination of amoxicillin and sulbactam, they can cause a lot of diarrhea. Then with antibiotics, we can also have the development of clostridium difficile, which can cause diarrhea. Changes in the mesenteric blood flow as occurs in patients with chemotherapy agents, radiation, they can also cause secretion of certain enzymes which can result in diarrhea. Provocation of internal inflammation like patients with inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease can also result in diarrhea which can be, be, be with or without blood. Then there is apoptotic enteropathy which is basically against subsequent to patients who are getting chemotherapy agents and radiation. Now it is very imperative to take a complete medical, medical history from the patient as to which medicine he is taking because only then we can delineate whether the medicine which he is taking is resulting in diarrhea because in India there is easy availability of over the counter uh, medicines that is called OTC medications and supplements which are consumed by patients without knowing about it. The next step is to differentiate between acute and chronic diarrhea in the approach to a case of diarrhea is to distinguish between acute and chronic diarrhea. As I told you earlier, acute diarrhea is something which is less than 4 weeks of duration. It is most, most commonly caused by infection and it is self-limiting. Often no treatment is required. Stool testing and other studies indicate the presence of certain and clinical epidemiological features. Chronic diarrhea on the other hand is one which is more than 4 weeks of duration. It is less likely to have a spontaneous remission and we must approach this case in a broad based manner in a with a differential diagnosis in mind so that we could treat the patient accordingly. Now if the diarrhea is chronic, the third step in the approach to a case of diarrhea is to know whether the diarrhea is acute or chronic. Acute diarrhea is one which is less than 4 weeks of duration. Most commonly it is caused by infection and it is self limiting. Often no evaluation is required for this and perhaps no treatment. Now we must be aware of the acute diarrhea which could be viral out of which rota virus, norwalk virus and norwalk like viruses are there. Then certain protozoal infection can also cause acute diarrhea. Acute diarrhea can also be caused by bacterial infections preferably <coughs> that is with preformed uh, bacteria which has got preformed toxins like the staphylococcus, E. coli and cholera vibrio. These are all caused by, can cause acute diarrhea and in which most of these viruses basically are self limiting apart from cholera vibrio where one has to give fluids to the patient to combat the fluid loss. In the chronic diarrhea on the other hand is said to be when the diarrhea is more than 4 weeks of duration. It is less likely to resolve spontaneously and we must have a broad differential diagnosis for chronic diarrhea before we could manage them. Now, some of the common causes is cytomegalovirus infection, Clostridium difficile, Shigella and Salmonella, E. coli, Campylobacter jejuni are common bacterial infections which can cause chronic diarrhea. In a patient with chronic diarrhea, we must understand the causes which could be inflammatory, fatty or watery. Now, chronic diarrhea, one of the most common thing which is missed in day to day practice is to do a simple stool examination, a routine microscopic examination with occurred blood. This, was, this will help us to narrow down between inflammatory, fatty or watery diarrhea and just proceed towards the management of the patient. So, one must remember a simple stool test is one of the foremost important things in patients with diarrhea before launching on to giving the patient antibiotics or other probiotics. The inflammatory diarrhea basically is characterized by frequent small volumes of bloody stool which is accompanied by tenesmus that is gripes in the abdomen. There could be fever, there could be severe abdominal pain. If we do a stool examination, we will find leukocytes, leukocyte proteins and RBCs. Many times only leukocytes are found that is the pus cells. So, we must give a due weightage fundamentally indicates 
disrupted and inflamed mucosa like we have in patients with ulcerative colitis. So, a patient who has have, who is having chronic diarrhea or repeated attacks of diarrhea and which subsides with medication but relapses again, if we do a stool examination and we find pus cells or RBCs and pus cells and RBCs, we must keep inflammatory bowel disease in mind. Now, to come to a diagnosis, a flexible and sigmoidoscopy or coloscopy will come to the conclusion of we can take biopsies and confirm the diagnosis. This is characterized by greasy of fatty diarrhea is characterized by greasy or bulky stools that are difficult to flush. Patients with fatty diarrhea have loss of weight and in this we must have two things in mind that is malabsorption and mild digestion. Malabsorption occurs mainly in the mucosal transport system and which celiac disease has to be kept in mind. Celiac disease is now more commonly formed because we are looking into patients who have got loss of weight and fatty diarrhea. The other thing is maldigestion which is because of defect, defective hydrolysis of triglycerides. This occurs mainly in patients with chronic pancreatitis who have got again fatty diarrhea, who have got loss of weight with or without pain in the abdomen. So, we must keep both these celiac disease and pancreatic disease in mind to come to a conclusion of fatty diarrhea. <coughs> Endoscopy with small bowel biopsies will also help us to come to a conclusion of celiac disease where we can find mucosal villus atrophy which could be partial or total. Small bowel aspiration can also be performed while doing the endoscopy to find SIBO that is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and then Treat, patient, treat the patient accordingly. If there is mild digestion, then we must take help of an ultrasound, a CT scan or the latest the endo, endoscopic ultrasound to see the pancreas in the, the morphology of the pancreas in detail to find any mass, to find any evidence of chronic pancreatitis. If there is no abnormalities of small bubble and no evidence of chronic pancreatitis, then one should consider pancreatic exocrine function to do the pancreatic exocrine function. The next step is watery diarrhea. The watery diarrhea could be osmotic or secretory. In the osmotic diarrhea is caused by ingestion of poorly absorbed ions that is magnesium phosphate and sulphate which is there in antiacids. There could be lactose intolerance or sugar alcohol that is sorbitol and xylitol. If you do the stool pH, it should be less than 6 and in osmotic diarrhea, if you stop, if you ask the patient not to eat anything, the diarrhea settles down. So, basically the stool volume decreases this fasting is an indicative of osmotic diarrhea. Then fecal osmotic gap is also very important. Coming to secretory diarrhea is caused by disruption of the epithelial electrolyte transport. There are numerous diseases and procedures, <coughs> processes which can result in secreted diarrhea, bile acid malabsorption, inflammatory bowel disease, idiopathic or epidemic secreted diarrhea, neoplasia and one most important thing which is now coming up is peptide secreting neuroendocrine tumors. Now, patients with long history of relapsing history of watery diarrhea which settles down with antispasmodics and anti agents, but precipitates again without loss of weight. One should always consider neuroendocrine tumors. Now, neuroendocrine tumors are tumors of the <coughs> entochromaffin cells and they can be found anywhere from the stomach to the intestines. The common place is the appendix and there are two tests which help us to come to the conclusion of neuroendocrine tumors is doing a blood test called serum chromogranin A, 24 hour urine for 5 HIAA. Now, both these tests have got certain limitations, they are highly specific. The limitation is that serum chromogranin A should be done after stopping the proton pump inhibitors for minimum 3 weeks. During that period, if the patient is having any problem of acidity, of flatulence, you can give them H2 receptor antagonists. 
for 24 hour urinary 5 HIA, again there are certain food items like banana, nuts, plums, kiwis which have to be avoided before we go into the test for 5 HIA and a 24 hour urine sample has to be collected. Once these tests are positive, we can potentiate this thing by doing an PET MRI that is positron emission tomography MRI with a special dotated scan which picks up these smaller lesions in the intestines that is the neuroendocrine tumors. Once they are localized, we could do an endoscopy, take a biopsy and confirm the diagnosis. And the treatment is very rewarding in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. Complete treatment can be done by surgery or by injection which is called sandostatin. Now coming to factitious diarrhea, that is factitious diarrhea is unintentionally self-inflicted diarrhea disorder basically most common by using laxatives. People take laxatives which are available in the market over the counter medicines or even home remedies, they can result in diarrhea. A factory origin should be considered for persons in whom diarrhea remains undiagnosed after thorough investigation. Consider factitious diarrhea evaluation of the patient is very important. Pseudomelanosis coli, which occurs because of use of anthraquinone laxatives like Senna and Kasarka for more than 6 to 8 months can result in pseudomelanosis coli and resulting in diarrhea. <coughs> Patient may be unaware that they are ingesting laxatives because there may be natural ingredients in certain herbs and tea other health supplements. In the end, I would like to end my talk by telling <coughs> that in patients of diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome should be kept in mind. Now, irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion, it should not be kept at the first diagnosis and it is characterized by recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort that occurs from time to time and should have one or two of these following that is pain or discomfort which improves with defecation and onset associated with change in frequency of bowel movements and onset associated with change in the form and appearance of the stool. If the patient is having history of colorectal can cancer in the family, if there is history of rectal bleeding, anemia, then this should ring a bell in the ear that it should be investigated further. Otherwise, irritable bowel syndrome has to be kept in mind. It is typically when the stool amount is less than 400 grams in 24 hours, the consistency varies from loose to soft. Diarrhea does not wake the patient in the night from the sleep. Long treatments extending from adolescence with no benefit and labs, hemoglobin, ESR, albumin are all normal and as I again reiterate that irritable bowel syndrome should be a diagnosis exclusion rather than the first diagnosis. Now for treatment of irritable bowel syndrome, the first and foremost is that the patient should be counseled from time to time. If the diarrhea is there, we can give stool binders out of which Isambol husk is one of the common thing and they should also be tackled on the psychological front. Many patients have anxiety, they have got anxiety neurosis, they should be tackled simultaneously which will benefit a lot in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. Patients who have got a lot of tenesmus or discomfort in the abdomen which results in loose tools, antispasmodics like mebeverine derivatives are of great benefit. Thank you.